1962, famed science fiction writer and futurist Arthur Clarke generated his three laws. They are, one, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Two, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And three, which is the most famous and most often cited, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. In 1952, Isaac Asimov, in his book Foundation and Empire, wrote a similar phrase. An uninformed public tends to confuse scholarship with magicians. In the short story, The Hound of Death, which Agatha Christie wrote in 1933, she said, the supernatural is only the nature of which the laws are not yet understood. I once saw a magician, someone who does sleight of hand, explain the meaning of magic. He said the audience can see the opening circumstance and the closing circumstance, but they are without any understanding of the process. It is a complete mystery to the observer. This is what makes it magic. Webster's 1828 dictionary gives several definitions for magic. One, the art or science of putting into action the power of spirits or the science of producing wonderful effects by the aid of superhuman beings or of departed spirits, sorcery, enchantment. Two, the secret operations of natural causes. Interesting that he ties magic together with spirits or superhuman beings. Many people today have a few of God which puts him in this magic realm. We complain, God, we have this problem, please fix it. It is not that he cannot fix our problem. He is perfectly capable of fixing any and every problem. However, he is more than a big fixing machine in the sky, a magic God to be swayed by our incantations and woeful pleading. It is not that Yahweh cannot fix our problems. Sometimes he just has a different end in mind in bringing you through your circumstances. If he just fixed everything, we would never grow spiritually. Perhaps there is something he wants you to learn, some faulty thinking that he is trying to wash out of you. Despite the fact that we do not understand all of Jehovah's workings, it does not mean that he does not have those workings. Back to Clark's third law, magic is indistinguishable from advanced technology. In fact, Yahweh is the work of the ultimate advanced technology, and Yeshua exhibited it while on the earth in bodily form. This tells us that we have much to learn about the mysterious workings of Yahweh, which can actually be revealed and understood as we are in this bodily form. Proverbs 25.2 It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. Sometimes our problems are medical. Yet even secular scientists understand the link between disease and emotional state, and there are many references to how this plays out. For example, Proverbs 14.30, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bones. If you are in envy and jealousy, you are destined for a medical malfunction. This is the word of Yehovah. Either Yehovah is in charge of everything in the universe, or he is not. Everything has a cause, as it is written in Proverbs 26, 2. As the bird by wandering, as a swallow by flying, so the curse clauseless shall not come. Contrary to mistaken opinion, the Bible does not state that you are what you eat. It says that you are what you think. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, says he to you, but his heart is not with you. This definitely reveals some of the mysterious workings of God. We are taught by Yeshua to monitor our thoughts with respect to others, but we are not so conscious of our thoughts with respect to ourselves. Nonetheless, the believer should be willing to examine himself or herself to see first and foremost if he or she is holding any unforgiveness. This is the biggest block to healing, as is taught by many. We also all carry some scars from childhood, either real or perceived hurts, which must be processed in light of our walk with Yehovah and our spiritual maturity. The mind-body connection is very complex, and as we have seen, sin will cause disease. 
It is plainly taught that unforgiveness is a sin according to Scripture. Matthew six fourteen and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Sometimes we simply have a sin problem and need to redefine our definition of sin. In Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you shall be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the law, the word here in Hebrew is Torah, of your God, I will also forget your children. It could be that if we examine our generations, we will find where a sin came from. For example, we can see in Abraham's family, he lied concerning his wife, as did his son after him. Later, Jacob falls prey to lying about his own identity. It is also possible that there is sin in our generations of which we are not aware and which cannot be discovered by self-examination. I am not saying that Yeshua has not taken care of these by the cross, but Hasatan is a legalist, and if a legal right was established in prior generations, the adversary has the grounds for continuing to afflict the believer until the curse is broken off. Where there is no direct knowledge, such sins can be revealed by the Holy Spirit. This is something we often see in the families of Freemasons. You can easily find out what types of curse are called down upon the families of those binding themselves to this secretive order. It is a difficult thing to admit, but nevertheless it holds true. Our inclination is to say, unfair, we are not responsible for the sins of our forefathers. However, the Bible says that we are born in sin and we clearly do not want what is fair. All we really deserve is punishment. Furthermore, we see the great prophets of Yahweh repenting for their sins of their generations. Daniel 9.16 O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I beseech you, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and your people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Jeremiah 14.20 we acknowledge, O Yehovah, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Leviticus 26, 40-42 If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. Nehemiah 9.2 And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers, and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Let us examine the case of Mordechai as told in the book of Esther. Mordechai, who serves Jehovah as a Jew, is presented as a righteous man who is unwilling to bow down before the wicked Haman. What ties these two men together in their generations? We see that Mordechai is from the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of King Saul, who ruled some five or six hundred years prior to Mordechai. We also find that Haman is an Agagite, one descended from the king of the Amalekites, whom Saul was commanded to slay. If no Amalekites had been left alive, there would have been no Haman to afflict the Jews in Esther's time. However, because the commandment of Jehovah was not properly executed, the door for affliction remains open. We see in the story an eventual resolution to the open door and that Mordechai is the agent by which Haman will be dispatched. Although Mordechai would most likely have known the story of, of kings Saul and Agag, we see his reaction is one of confidence with humility. He is willing to wait until all is revealed in the course of events. He trusts Jehovah for his future and his prosperity. Although we know nothing of Mordechai's prayers at this time, we see by his behavior that he remains faithful to God. He does not try to make his case before King Ahasuerus, but he is patient for the revelation of the result. He does not go about complaining against his ancestor for putting him in this precarious position. 
We should always try to view any person as separate from their sin. We understand that others have circumstances in their lives that have afflicted them. It is always best to forgive and move on. This does not mean that you remain in abusive relationships, only that you trust Jehovah to manage and judge the other person's behavior. Your goal is to forgive and be free. And that will be true of your generations as well. There is no magic in it. It is the law of Jehovah.